Summary of Into Thin Air by John Krakauer. Since 1852, people have known that Mount Everest is the biggest mountain in the world, and since then, travelers and daredevils have been trying to climb it. Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay were the first people to reach the top of Everest. This happened in the 1950s. A lot of people have been interested in climbing in the 50 years that have passed since Hillary and Norgay accomplished their goals. The book's author, John Krakar, grew up idolizing Hillary, Norgay, and other mountain climbers. He has been a good mountain climber since he was in his late teens. Krakar says that in the last few decades, Everest has drawn a surprising amount of tourists. Expert hikers lead organized trips to the top of the mountain and charge their clients a lot of money. In 1996, Krakar made a deal with Outside Magazine to write a feature story about how Everest climbing was becoming more and more like a business. In Into Thin Air, Krakar writes about his trip to climb Everest, which ended in a well-known disaster. In March 1996, Krakar takes a plane to Kathmandu, where he meets Rob Hall, who will be his guide. Hall is a well-known climber who is known for being very careful and organized with his clients. Krakar meets some of the other people who will climb Everest with Hall. These people include Drs. Beck Weathers and Peter Hutchinson, a Japanese personnel head named Yasuko Namba, and a male worker named Doug Hansen. Krakar gets along with his friends pretty well, but he feels strangely separate from them. This is because most of them are very rich and haven't really climbed mountains before. Doug Hansen is a noted exception. With the help of a local grade school, he was able to pay the $65,000 permit fee to climb Everest. The year before, Hansen and Hall tried to climb Everest, but a storm was coming and they had to turn back. Hansen is keen to reach the top of the mountain this year. Hall's team also has a lot of Sherpa climbers. The Sherpa are a small group of people who have always lived in the Himalayas. Most Sherpas grow up in high places, so they are used to climbing. Krakar says that the number of tourists who go to Everest has destroyed some Sherpa villages and turned them into hotels and cabins. He also says that Sherpas are more likely to die on Everest than other climbers, even though they are good at it. This is likely because many Sherpas work on climbing trips and aren't treated as well as paid customers. Hall's team is not the only one climbing Everest at the same time. Scott Fisher is a close foe of Hall's in the climbing business. He is taking his own team to the top, which includes well-known socialite Sandy Hill Pittman as a client. Fisher is thought to be less tense and more easygoing than Hall. A man called Mukalu Gao is in charge of a Taiwanese team. Last year, a member of the Taiwanese team died while climbing Mount McKinley because of a major accident. There is also a South African team, led by a man named Ian Woodall who is not a nice person. Woodall put together an amazing and diverse team of climbers at first, but most of them quit because of how rude and argumentative he was. This left Woodall with second-rate climbers. Finally, an IMAX team led by Krakar's old friend David Brashears is making a movie about Mount Everest. Hall's team is by far the most prepared and planned. In other words, it's the team where you'd be least likely to expect something bad to happen. The mission goes on with Hall's group. They get to base camp at the bottom of Everest, where they do a series of routines over the next few weeks to help their bodies get used to the higher altitude. Hall takes his team slowly from base camp to camp 1, which is higher up, and then to camps 2 and 3. Along the way, Krakar makes friends with Doug Hansen and a nice young guide named Andy Harris. He also starts to like and admire his teammates more and more. Beck Weathers and Yasuko Namba are definitely amateurs, but they are honest and want to do well. On the way up the mountain, Krakar and the other climbers often feel sick, dizzy, and thirsty. This is because of altitude sickness and the hard work of rising. Krakar has always loved hiking because it gives him a sense of independence and freedom. However, climbing Everest with a big group makes it hard for him to enjoy the thrill. Anatoly Bukreev, one of Scott Fisher's paid guides, shows himself to be a very skilled but weirdly careless guide on Scott Fisher's team. Even though it's his job to help the weaker hikers up the mountain, 
Bukreev goes ahead of everyone else, saying that if the clients need his help that much, they shouldn't be on Everest. Because Bukreev wasn't paying attention, Fisher has to work twice as hard. Even though he's been climbing for a long time, he starts to feel tired and get altitude sickness. Both Fisher and Hall's teams and the Taiwanese team have reached Camp 4, which is very close to the top of Everest, by the beginning of May. Hall says that he and Fisher will climb to the top of the mountain on May 10, but neither of them knows that the Taiwanese team plans to climb up on the same day. Before the final climb, Hall tells his clients to take concentrated oxygen from special tanks. This will help their bodies get stronger and protect them from hypothermia and other problems that can happen at high altitudes. Krakar sees that Bukreev doesn't use extra air. This could be because he's macho and sure of himself, which isn't unusual for professional climbers. The team's left for the top on May 10. Krakar gets to the top of Everest before 2 p.m., which is the suggested, but not proven, cut-off time for Hall's team. However, he runs out of air almost immediately and has to turn around. Hutchinson and some of the other team members decide to turn around earlier so they don't have to risk being on the peak after 2 p.m. Soon after 2 p.m., storm clouds show on the horizon, and soon after that, Everest's peak is hit by a huge snowstorm. Even though there is a storm, Krakar is able to get back to Camp 4. On his way back to the tent, he sees someone he thinks is Andy Harris. He sends this person in the direction of the tents, but he doesn't know that this person is severely oxygen-deprived and can barely move. When Krakar gets to the tent, he goes to sleep right away. Krakar doesn't know it at the time, but most of his team and Fisher's team are caught in a dangerous blizzard. Partly because Hall didn't confirm a cutoff time, partly because Fisher is flexible with his clients, and partly because oxygen loss causes stress and confusion, the climbers get very confused. Scott Fisher, who is tired and out of air, goes in the wrong way, and many of Rob Hall's clients, including Beck Weathers, Yasuko Namba, and Doug Hansen, get lost in the storm. At this point, it's no longer possible to know for sure what happens to some of Krakar's friends and partners. As before, Anatoly Bukreev has climbed ahead of his clients and made it back to Camp 4. He and Neil Beidelman, a guide for Scott Fisher's team, bravely go out into the storm to look for their lost clients. Beidelman and Bukreev are able to save many lives, including that of Mukalu Gao. Bukreev also finds Scott Fisher's dead body, which he has to leave in the snow. When Rob Hall isn't around, Peter Hutchinson takes over as the real head of Hall's team. Hutchinson puts together a search party with the rest of the team, and they find the bodies of Yasuko Namba and Beck Weathers. But when they find Namba and Weathers, who are barely alive, the group has to make the hard choice to leave them in the snow because they will probably die and the group needs to save its resources. Back at Camp 4, Hutchinson and the others sent a call for help over the radio. Base camp sends a group of Sherpas to help at Camp 4, and the group starts to go down. Beck Weathers shows up outside Camp 4 just as the group is about to go down. Even though everyone thought Weathers was dead, he somehow got up and walked back to camp. Krakar wants to stay at Camp 4 to look after Weathers, but Hutchinson talks him into starting the fall or he will die. When the storm is over, Yeo and Beck Weathers are taken to the hospital by Chopper. Yasuko Namba, Scott Fisher, Doug Hansen, Andy Harris, and Rob Hall are just some of the hikers who died in the storm. Krakar feels terrible because he went to sleep when he got to Camp 4. If he hadn't, he could have saved Andy Harris and Yasuko Namba's lives. When Krakar's story about the Everest climb comes out in Outside Magazine, the families of the hikers who died start hating on him right away. He still has trouble with survivor's guilt and it's hard for him to talk about how he feels with other people. He talks to Neil Beidelman, one of Scott Fisher's team's guides, and they both say they feel guilty about Yasuko Namba's death. About the author John Krakar is an American author, journalist, rescuer, and climber who has won awards for his work. He is known for his books about the outdoors and his skill at writing repertorial narratives. At age 8, Krakar's father taught him how to climb mountains. 
After he graduated from Hampshire College in 1976, he spent the next 20 years climbing mountains all over the world. In 1996, he climbed Mount Everest. After a storm killed the other four climbers on his team, he was the only one to make it back down the mountain alive. The event gave him the idea for his 1997 book, Into Thin Air, which went on to become a number one New York Times bestseller and a Pulitzer Prize nominee. Into the Wild, which he wrote in 1996, stayed on the New York Times list of bestsellers for more than two years. In 1999, the Academy of Arts and Letters honored Krakar's great writing and critical news by giving him an Academy Award in Literature. In 2003 and 2009, he wrote Under the Banner of Heaven, which was about religious extremism in the American West, and Where Men Win Glory, which was about pro football player turned Army soldier Pat Tillman. Krakar's most recent book, Three Cups of Deceit, came out in 2011. It looks into claims that Nobel Prize winner Greg Mortensen lied and cheated. As a bold and adventurous writer, Krakar has continued to push the limits of his writing in places like Outside, GQ, National Geographic, Rolling Stone, Architectural Digest, The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Smithsonian, and Byliner. Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.